Hello and welcome to the Blues Focus podcast. Uh, I'm your host for today, Tom, and I'm joined by our usual host, John, from Blues Hello, Focus. Tom. How are you, John? Good, mate. Thank you. And our special guest for today is Ian Danter. How are you, Ian? Very good, Tom. Nice to good. see you. Good. Nice to see you too. Just quickly before we get going, I uh, just want to give a little shout out to our Patreon page. Go check it out. Link will be in the description. A um, few shout outs to uh, current Patreons, uh, JM Real, Simon Evans and Val Bowen North. <laughs> um, so thank you to you guys for donating to the Patreon page. Um, just quickly as well, before we get started, to never miss a pod, go check out bluesfocus.co.uk or bluesfocuspodcast.co.uk. But um, all the links to all of our previous pods with special guests are all on there. So to never miss anything, just go check it out and uh, yeah, we'll get going. So um, just a bit of background to your, your career for the viewers, Ian. Um, obviously, you've had quite an interesting career in media that spans from like local radio, the BR, BRMB uh, drive, th- drive show uh, through to national media at Talk Sport 1 and Talk Sport 2, covering huge football competitions such as Premier League, Champions League, World Cups. And um, so just briefly talk us how that all came about for you, really. Well, it, it, it kind of fluky in, in so many ways, because up until my late 20s, I had a totally different career. I was a, uh, a wannabe rock star um, and I was a guitar salesman in Birmingham at Musical Exchanges, the massive guitar shop on uh, Old Snow Hill, which is no longer there. And I worked there until mm, sort of early 97. And then I got a job uh, working for Laney, who are the amplifier manufacturers in Cradley Heath. And I switched from selling guitars to distributing guitars because Laney had just won a contract to distribute a brand of guitars called Ibanez in the UK. And that became my job. But just before I took that job, um, my best mate, uh, Keith Laurent, who's still my uh, closest confidant all these years later and a former bandmate, he wrote a letter to Tom Ross at BRMB in early 97 saying, my mate Ian does the best Trevor Francis impression I've ever heard. You should get him on the radio. And I don't know how many letters Tom used to get saying, you know, I need, I want to be on the radio. What can I do to get in? Blah, blah, blah. But something in that letter piqued his interest and he rang me at the shop before I left, before I started my um, distribution job. And he asked me whether I would record a sketch for the Capital Gold uh, build-up show on a Saturday afternoon between two and three doing impressions of whoever I did. So I did that. It wasn't paid. It was just for a bit of a laugh. And to cut a long story short, even though I switched jobs, those requests for sketches kept coming through 97 into the 90, 97, 98 season. I started getting paid for them. And then Tom called me in one day and took me to the office of the program controller at BRMB, whose name was Paul Jackson. And this was February, 1998. And he, within 10 seconds of me sitting down in his office, he'd offered me the job of the flying eye travel reporter yeah. for BRMB. And I had to make a decision there and then. Do I quit my job with Laney and take this risk? Mm. You could say it was a risk, you know, didn't know anything about radio. Um, But I took it, I quit my job, um, and within two weeks, I was the travel presenter for BRMB, and it all started there in early 1998. That's brilliant. Um, Yeah, so I I was going to come on to that, uh, the flying eye, but I'm glad that you've mentioned that makes my job a bit easier. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I suppose, obviously, that's your background in media, Um, then on to... The, the main reason why you're here, why we're all here. Um, how did you become a Birmingham City fan or like growing up as a youngster, where did the masochistic urge come well, from much, to become a Blues fan? <laughs> much as you will know, Tom, it's a hereditary disease being a Birmingham City fan. <laughs> and um, much as with your old man, um, my dad and my granddad and, you know, the whole dancer 
family are blue noses. And I first went with my dad and my granddad, and I think one of my brothers and my cousin to a game against Stoke in early 1974, where we got beat. Jimmy Greenoff, who just left Birmingham for Stoke, came back and scored against us. So it was a, a, a the perfect early example <laughs> of what it meant to be a Birmingham fan. You know, get used to this, Ian. Uh, you know, my granddad probably would have said to me that they'll break your heart. Yeah. But, you know, so this was 74. And, and within, well, just over a year after that, I remember my dad not speaking to me or my two brothers for days after Fulham beat us in the FA Cup semi-final replay at Main Road. I can remember the morning after we lost, I came down to breakfast before I went to school and my dad had the Birmingham Post open and I think the banner headline on the back was something like 30 seconds because that's all that was left in that replay before there would have been another replay Yeah, between Birmingham and Fulham and that's what happened when there was an awful mix-up at the back and Fulham scored their winner and went to the final and that that broke my dad's heart, but he kept going with me and, and, and with others. It was a good, it was a good 10 years before my dad saw one relegation too many and gave up. And that's when I became the principal fan in the family, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So uh, kind of carried on the torch then um, after your baptism of fire. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I kept persuading dad to come with me. On occasion after that. So it was like 86. Was it 86 we were relegated? It was. Or was it 85? But I, at times I would say, Dad, um, you know, it's a midweek or something. I, I, you know, we're playing at home. Do you fancy coming? It's only, you know, a fiver. And he'd say, who are we playing? And I'd say, oh, I'd whoever it was, Port Vale or Shrewsbury or something. Yeah. And he'd sort of go, oh, all right then. So we'd go and we'd, we'd sit down and we'd, we'd, you know, have a good evening. And then the game would start. And within 10 minutes... He just dig me in the ribs and says, it's not got any better, is it? This is going to be nil-nil. And I thought, Dad, knock it off. And of course, he was almost invariably right. It would either be nil-nil or our visitors would get a sporty winner. And all the way home, he said, this is why I don't go anymore. And it would happen cyclically. You know, every, every four or five months, I persuaded him to come down again. And one of my huge regrets in life is that my dad and my granddad never got to see what happened at, at Wembley 10 years ago because yeah. my, and the, I, I, there'll be Birmingham fans who will have similar stories about countless relatives who deserved to see what happened at Wembley that day, but, but, but never did. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, many fans can uh, agree on that one, you know, suffer years and years of pain just to miss probably the greatest moment in our history. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but then look at where we are now 10 years later, <laughs> unfortunately. But we'll get on to that later. Yeah. Um, so I suppose, um, really, what, what was your journey like growing up supporting Blues, you know, uh, particular moments? And I suppose, did you ever realise that you would one day become part of the fabric at the club? No, no, not at all. It, it was just a like a family tradition thing. You know, if you got the chance to go, you go. Um I went to most games. I can't pretend that I was a season ticket holder. Um, I just went, um, you know, because there were some weekends where I couldn't go because I was working. Um, the nature of the job that I ended up taking once I left school was that, you know, a season ticket I'd rarely get to use. So I went whenever I could. Um, memories of growing up watching Birmingham. Well, certainly I only have vague memories of that team with Francis and Hatton. Because by the time I started going, we'd actually sold Bob Latchford to Everton. He'd gone. But we got Howard Kendall in. Uh, and I remember the relationship between Kendall and Francis being, they were almost, they were so on the same wavelength as, as, as midfielder and striker. They were fantastic. So I've, I've probably got clearer memories of the Jim Smith side that, was kind of bought with the Francis money when he was sold to Forest. Yeah. Archie Gemmell, Colin Todd, Dave Langan, Frank Worthington, 
Alan Ainsco, um, Neil Watmore. It didn't really happen for Neil. And I think we, we spent a good 300-odd thousand pounds on him from Bolton. And he was the one cog in that wheel that didn't quite come off for Birmingham. I've always said the irony is that that slew of players that we signed, with Francis still there, oh. we'd have won something. Yeah. But yeah. there's there's the thing. But so I have a, a memory of that. Uh, you know the, the 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 FA Cup heartaches going out to Altrincham, which was uh, Ron Saunders' last game. Um, <laughs> game against Watford when St Andrews was more packed than I can ever remember it being. When John Barnes was at his mercurial best that day and knocked us out in the in the sixth round, um, I remember that day vividly uh, as being huge disappointment but there have been good times too and we will get on to you know life in the third tier uh, I'm sure in a little while but that season 94-95 under Barry Fry was such great fun yeah. and there were some amazing Brentford in the spring of 95 when we were both going for the the title and we won 2-0 and I, you know St Andrews was you know, being rebuilt at the time, you know, the, the, the two new sides were there. They hadn't rebuilt the railway end at that point. Kevin Francis scored the, the first goal, did his knee ligaments, I think, in scoring that goal because he was carrying an injury as it was. Liam Dash scored the second. The, the Nights like that. Nights like that. And the, there was a game against Oxford a couple of months previous, maybe a month previous in that running, uh, where it was just a brilliant atmosphere and you sense that there was a real positivity about the place that, that Barry Fry was a huge part of with his personality. So I, I've got yeah. very fond memories, even though it was in the third tier of English football, very fond memories of that season, <laughs> mainly because we got out first time of asking, maybe I wouldn't have been so fond had we not made it. Um, but yeah. And, Ian, and, just, and those, sorry. Sorry, just, just on that. Cause that, that was probably, yeah, sort of my time when I, when I was going up a lot, you know, as a sort of a seventeen-year-old, and it, it, what what do you what do you think of you know those times? And okay, you know, every, everything's I suppose relative. It was in a third tier, yeah. But I probably wouldn't change that for a lot of the seasons in the Prem, where it, it, for me, and I don't know what. And again, this is probably the, the question for you. It didn't quite feel the same for me in the Prem. I don't know why. I don't know because I've been downtrodden for the previous 15 years. Well, it just didn't well, feel... The, the Premier League, of course, when, when teams who aren't the hardy perennials of the Premier League get there, then the fans have to get used to the fact that they're not going to win as many games as they did in the divisions below. Yeah. I mean, there are so, I mean you know... The, the the second season we were in the Premier League because you know uh, when when Fassell came in and we really looked at home yeah as as a Premier League side um, that was great and of course the the, the season before relegation under Alex McLeish when we finished ninth nice, we yeah. looked completely at home at that level and we were yeah. winning more than we were losing um, but yeah when you're in the champ well. In theory, when you're in the championship, you should win more than you lose. But obviously, that's not the case right now and hasn't been the case for seven or eight years. Yeah. But that season in in what was the third division under, under Barry, at least when we got relegated, when we when we went down, we lost it. We won at Tranmere, but went down because the Baggies had won us. I think I'm right in saying at Portsmouth. And I was living by the Blues Ground at that time. I was living at a mate's house on St Andrew's Road. So I was literally in the shadow of the railway end. And I remember we went to the park. It was a beautiful sunny afternoon, Borsley Park. And we kicked a ball around, me and my mate Gray, for about half an hour. And of course, we were both, up, we were really knocked off that we got relegated. But at the back of our minds, there was that feeling that because Barry Fry was there and because Sullivan and the two gold brothers and Karen Brady were in there. There was a feeling that there was something developing that, that you know, had a bit of positivity about it. Because let's yeah. face it, before Gold and Sullivan arrived, we'd had the Kumar brothers and the, the Mark I kit and, and the, the years of Malays then. So there was a feeling of positivity about that. And I, I most certainly don't have that feeling of anything positive that you can look at now as we circle the plug hole once again, 
compared to how I felt, despite the obvious disappointment of going down in 94, at least we felt, well, we've got a manager that understands. And all right, that we had the revolving door of strikers, you know, Siggy Rushfelt, Bjorn Otto Bragstad, uh, <laughs> Dave Regis, Miguel de Souza, the, the, the players that turned up, some of them were really good. I had a soft spot for players like Steve McGavin, who, yeah. um, who I thought was a terrific striker, probably not quick enough, but I thought he was, I thought he was a really clever player. He, uh, he kept he, signing players out of non league yeah, and they were called like Ken, the... Ken Charlery, you know. Um, but we signed some brilliant players who who stuck around right the way through to the Premier League era. Ian Bennett, Paul Devlin, Michael Johnson. Yeah. Martin Granger. Yeah. No, Those absolutely, players absolutely that, that, no. that, that, that went on that journey with us. Yeah. Definitely. Um, we've got Martin Granger coming on uh, this week as well, actually. So, right. um, yeah, that one should be good. Just popping that that one in there well, for you guys. I, <laughs> I played in his testimonial game at St Andrews. What was that, 2005? Uh, he very kindly asked me to come and play. And I got 20 minutes at the end. And... It was a bitterly cold night. It was like November or something. And the funniest thing for me, I'd come on, played it right back. So I've got Ian Clarkson on my left, guiding me through, bless him. And uh, Trevor Francis was on the pitch. He was playing. No. And he, I just, I crept over the halfway line for probably the only time that I was on the pitch. And I, Trevor was in possession. And I put stupidly put my hand up, Trev! And he spotted me and sent this tracer bullet of a pass over to me. And it was, it's coming and I think, don't screw it up, don't screw it up, don't screw it up. <laughs> and it hit, it hit the bottom of my right boot, bounced into the turf and over the head of the onrushing academy play, because it was like blue celebrities against the academy or something, bounced over the head of the academy kid that was rushing straight to me. And it disoriented, so I could run round him and play the ball up to Paul Furlong. It looked genious. It was, <laughs> it was, I got a round of applause for it, and it was most definitely the, the, the best accidental touch I've ever had on the football pitch. But that's it. Trevor Francis passed me the ball. Wow. Game over. Job done. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no need to do anything else. Yeah, that will live long in anyone's memory. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so obviously, suddenly after all of that, you're kind of working at Blues, um, so I suppose just talk us through your time and how did that all come about? I, um, I'd not been at BRMB very long. So it was uh, sort of um, 98. And I went to Bob Matthews, the late great Bob Matthews, who was part of the commercial department at Birmingham at the time. And um, for once, I was quite bullish. I went to Bob and said, what you're doing during the, you know, the, the, the Tano announcements and everything, it's, it needs some pizzazz. It needs a bit, bit more fun, a bit more life. And Bob agreed. And he said, okay, we'll give you a trial. So um, initially um, another colleague of mine, another blue nose, Mark Tompkins, who now does a lot of uh, golf commentary and whatnot um, around the world. We went in as a, as a pair, but Mark quickly, couldn't commit so I start I went in the commentary box worked with uh, Rob Shannon and John Teague who were the, the guys in there that helped me um, get the team sheets and we, we had the desk and everything in there so yeah that would have been the 98 99 season I guess when or, or maybe a little bit before the end of the previous season when I came in and sorted out the the playlist um, sorted out the the loop on the, the, the end of Mr. Blue Sky. So that kept people clapping to the jung, 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 yeah. jung. I did that at BRB. I sort of chopped that up. So that kept going for a good minute and a half. Um, and Trevor Francis brought me in a copy of the Tampera. It was his idea to play the Tampera because his youngest son, James, had got the single. And Trevor had heard it and thought that could work. So again, he gave that to me. And I, again, I had to do a little edit of that. So the Tampera came into being whilst I was there. And um, 
also I recorded my version of Singing the Blues with Tom Ross. Um, yeah. Around that time, which I started playing naturally because I put it together with Tom. But it, you know, it took on a life of its own. It was great. It sold 4,000 odd copies or something in the club shop, I, I was told. Yeah. So I did that. Um, and w one of the, the funniest outgrowings of doing that job was the whole who thing, because <laughs> that was a total accident, I, I promise you, because what happened was when my, my intention was when a Birmingham player was being substituted, I wanted to leave a gap between his name and the name of the player who was replacing him so that the, the, the Blues fans could give a, a round of applause, appreciation to the player coming off and then to the player coming on. So I felt that player who was coming off knew his job had been appreciated that day. So he knew that there was a round of applause for him and the guy coming on knew there was a round of applause for him. So I left a, a pregnant pause, you know, uh, substitution for Birmingham, replacing number 11, Peter Undlove. Gap, he'd get a round of applause. Number nine, Dele Adebola, something like that. Yeah. And I did that for the opposition as well. Because it was, it just become habitual for me to leave that that gap, and so it was the Blues fans who stuck the who in because they 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 sensed that gap was coming, and they just decided right, let's have some fun with us, and it reached its zenith when I was there at least when we played Newcastle in the League Cup. And we were beating them, and Alan Shearer was taken off as substitute. And I pressed the button because we could you could see the board was going up with the numbers. And I substitution for Newcastle United, and all around you could hear shh, 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 shh. everyone around the gun. Here we go, here we go. This is it, this is it. So there was total silence, total silence. I bet the Newcastle fans didn't know what was going on in the in the railway end. And I just get replacing number nine, Alan Shearer. <gasps> <laughs> I've never heard it done with more gusto than it was that night. And Keith Gillespie, I think, came out and got it as well. <laughs> uh, uh, there was laughter in amongst the Uyas. There was laughter because they, it's like Blues fans have been waiting for a player of that sort of pedigree of Alan Shearer yeah. to get the who treatment and he got it. And, and that was of course, before Premier League came along, but I, I, I moved on um, by that stage uh, from, from doing the commentary box duty. So it was only about a year or 18 months that I did in the commentary box, but it was great fun nonetheless to do that job. Fantastic. Yeah. But both, yeah. of, both of my kids, both of my boys who obviously I've passed the, the, the poison chalice down to um they absolutely love that absolutely i mean they'd be going up since they were sort of four, four or five and it's just things like that and I, I said you know a bit like the barry fry era it's things like that and the who's and loads and loads of stuff that happens in blues that makes i believe you know i think every fan says it across the country but our identity it's things like that they're a little bit it's just madness the whole because the whole club's madness and, and i think that's why it fits so well the great thing about Birmingham fans that I've found down the years, and, and every club's got, you know, fans they don't want associated with them. So we'll leave those aside. But Birmingham fans' sense of gallows humour, I've always loved. That They're very uh, self-deprecating. Yeah. They'll happily put themselves down um, as well as give the opposition plenty. Uh, I'll always credit Birmingham fans for having that, uh, the ability to look at themselves and, and laugh at themselves. It's not easy right now. I understand that. But still, I think there's not many sets of supporters that have that ability. There are some. Don't, we're not alone in that. But I think we're one of just a few clubs that have that ability to look at ourselves and actually point the finger sometimes and go, look at the state of us. And <laughs> yeah. kind of laugh at it. I, I, and I love that. I really love that. What I don't know what game it was. It wasn't long ago. I, I think it might have been. It might, I think it was Coventry uh, a couple of games ago, and it was it was like something out of Benny Hill for about five minutes, just pinball everywhere, 
And me and my lads, we're just laughing at it. We're just laughing at it because it is that bad. You cannot believe <laughs> a club that 10 years ago beating Arsenal when a very, very good Arsenal team. And I think a lot of people forget that. That wasn't a, a run of the mill Arsenal They team. beat Barca at Nou Camp the week before or something like that in the yeah. Champions League. So, you know, it was... It was never... Yeah, but you know, you know and I know that they turned up that day thinking we were easy meat. They yeah. turned up in their track suits... They didn't turn up in suits. The fans turned up late. What was it like? As soon as those turnstiles opened, every Birmingham seat was taken. Yeah. An hour and a half before kickoff. Every single seat. Nobody wanted to waste a second to view that pitch. And you looked to, to the other end of the stadium, because I was in the TV gantry that day, looked to my right, and it was pockets of Arsenal fans, and they, they dribbled in slowly, slowly. And, of course, it was full by kickoff, but there was a blasé attitude around the whole Arsenal club that day, which we took advantage of. We still had to beat them, but they came into that final with completely the wrong attitude. Yeah. So, yeah. Ian, it's just, just given that you're, you're everybody... I mean, I'm an avid listener of Talk Sport, and you've, you've really sort of gone from, obviously, strength to strength, and obviously Talk Sport 2 and every, all what you do there. Everybody knows you're a Blues fan. <laughs> but how, how difficult is it, certainly maybe times like now, I'm not saying you need to be impartial, but because it's quite toxic at the moment, is it quite difficult just to rein it back a little bit and not maybe sort of go for the jugular? Or Well, I, these days I'm a commentator and I yeah. don't present shows. Um, my role is now as a commentator. And I haven't commentated on blues for, for a good while now, actually. I think the last time... The last time I did a blues game on... Talk Sport would have been the three three at Swansea. Okay, so that's a long time ago. Although, funnily yeah. enough, I've just found out this morning that I'm doing the the Sheffield Wednesday game on Saturday. God for help Sport you. <laughs> that because it's all right. Two of the bottom three currently that might change in midweek. Yeah, but they've chosen that as the three o'clock Talk Sport two commentary game. So that'll be the first time I'll have seen Birmingham live in the Karanka era. Yeah, um, and for a, a you know a, a good while before that, but back to your question, uh, when you do a Birmingham game, yeah, you, you can't be partisan. Yeah, you have to be impartial. You're doing it for the benefit of a national audience. So I have to respect, you know, Sheffield Wednesday fans, and you know, um, yeah, I can't paint a picture that isn't realistic. When I work for Tom, when I work for BRMB and Capital Gold, you could be partisan because you know you're broadcasting to a, a partisan audience yeah. and you can tailor your commentary slightly that way. But you learn very quickly when you join a national broadcaster that that doesn't wash. You can't do that. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. Um, and so that doesn't mean I'm harder on Birmingham than I should be because that's another thing that's leveled at you. Oh, you you're being really hard on them because you're because you're a blue nose. Yeah. You, know, you you learn how to be, you know, dispassionate about it. You learn how to, you know, be a proper neutral commentator. Because yeah. it's not just Birmingham and Sheffield Wednesday fans that'll be listening. They'll be just casual listeners yeah. who want to hear a championship game and want to hear what's going on. So yeah. uh, much much as I would like to sit there and stick my royal blue Bronx hat on and and give it plenty. Um, I wouldn't last very long in that job if I did. No. no. Yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously, you know, you must have some interesting stories to tell uh, from working at Blues. Obviously, the Who chant in particular being one. But uh, what were your most memorable moments working at Blues? I mean, we had Paul Tate on the podcast the other day and <laughs> he had plenty of <laughs> interesting stories to talk about. But I suppose just from your time at Blues, what, what kind of stood out for you? Well, I mean, I mentioned that that testimonial for for, for Martin Granger. That was a yeah. that was a great night for him, and he he, he I think there were about five thousand there. It was a bitterly cold night, and we, we felt for him a little because it, sh it should have been you know ten thousand at least there that night. Yeah, uh, to give him a, a send off. I mean, most of the time when I worked at Blues, you were you were in that little commentary box directly over the tunnel on the halfway line, the, the tunnel that doesn't get used, you know. Yeah. Um, and you, you're in that cosseted 
uh, little world and you didn't really get to see anybody other than, you know, uh, people like Rob and John that sat in the box with me. Um, so I, I, I didn't go to the dressing room. I didn't really have any much contact with the players. I do remember not long after I took the job, I went to West Hills because uh, Trevor had come up with this idea that he wanted individual goal music for individual scorers because Bolton had not long started using the James Brown, I feel good. Okay. I think yeah. for every goal. And Trevor had um, said, I want goal music that's tailored to each scorer. Can you go and find out what the players would want? So I went to West Hills and they were they finished a training session and they were all sitting down having lunch. It's one of the few times I actually got in there and you know and I was in the training ground with the squad. And um, the first person I asked, first person I bumped into was Martin Granger. And I said, Martin, uh, I do the Tannoy uh, announcements at, at Blues and um, the manager's suggesting that each goal scorer has their own individual music to accompany a goal that they score. What would you like used as yours? And he said, with without uh, a moment's hesitation, please release me. <laughs> <laughs> By Engelbert Humperdinck. And I thought at that moment, this isn't going to work. So I didn't bother asking anybody else because I think if, if I'm not, if that's symptomatic of how the, the players are feeling, because I don't think they were on a particularly good run at the time. Yeah. So, <laughs> that, 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 that was completely um, uh, left aside. I do remember one uh, funny story. Again, I, we'd been to Wast Hills um, and I'd gone separate to Tom because Tom and I had gone there to do a photo shoot for the Blue Nose Brothers single. So like yeah. Brian Hughes, Stan Lazaridis, Steve Robinson, I remember, was there. Uh, Benno, Nico Vassen. And we had a lovely group photo with me holding a guitar and Tom with his guitar and whatnot. And um, Tom had left his phone unattended and he had a, an old Nokia brick thing. And um, whilst he wasn't looking, Martin Granger, he's, he's featuring quite a lot here, isn't he, Grange? Yeah, it's good because we've got him on. on he may or, when you speak to him later in the week, he may well remember this himself. He got hold of Tom's phone and changed its language to Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom was then, we finished the, 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 and he just grabs his phone, doesn't look at it, puts it in his cradle by his steering wheel. And he heads back to, to Birmingham to BRMB, same as I did in my car. And whilst he's on the way back through Kings Norton or something, the phone rings. And of course it comes up on his screen, Gamma, Epsilon, Delta, you know, it's just all, it's all Greek to him, right? And Tom nearly swerves off the road because he, he, he can't recognise who it is. And um, because he didn't recognise who it was, he answered quite gruffly, apparently. He went, hello. And it turns out it was Doug Ellis ringing him. It, that, that was who was ringing him, but he didn't recognise it because it was all... In, and Doug was quite taken aback, apparently, by Tom being so gruff because normally... Tom sees it's Doug ring. Ah, oh, Mr. Chairman, you know, all that sort of. So that was, <laughs> so Grange completely did him up like a kipper on that one. <laughs> I, I must, there's another time I remember, one of the best nights I ever, ever, ever had was the 10th anniversary dinner of the playoff win with the Blue Squad that we held at uh, Edgbaston. Yeah. Was, uh, summer 2002. The whole squad came pretty much. There were barely anybody in that squad that couldn't make it. Stan Lazaridis flew from Australia, paid his own flight costs to come over and be part of, uh, of our evening. Um, I think Darren Purse had got some video of uh, that no one had ever seen before of the squad just on a, a walk around the hotel in the Vale of Glamorgan before they went to Cardiff that day. Um, Ian Bennett doing bird impressions, proper, you know, like Chaffinch, Sparrow, whatever, you know. Um, and we had a, like it, we had players up four at a time sitting on sofas, kind of soccer AM style. Oh, what a night that was. I, I don't know whether you were there, 
John. Uh, no, no, but I have seen that. Um, it that was movie. just the best fun night to be hosting that. Uh, and I will cherish that night for a very long time because that was laugh a minute. Uh, Jeff Kennis told some brilliant stories. Um, Husey wasn't far behind. There were some great laughs to be had. I'll, I'll cherish that night um, working, because I was working for Blues that night, even though that was, what, 2012 by that point. Yeah. And just, yeah. just quickly on that, what, did you ever find yourself getting a little bit starstruck? Did you ever in, in that sort of moment of clarity and thinking, whether it be when you were at Blues or just thinking, I can't oh, yeah. believe this yeah. is happening? Um, meeting Trevor for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd not long been working for Tom at that point. Um, so maybe this is 99, as, as a football reporter, because, of course, I started in the Flying Eye in 98. And yeah. by the following year, I was also doing match reports. Tom had, you know, got me into his team. And I started yeah. watching Warsaw a lot, actually, in those early days under Ray Graydon. But... He started giving me more responsibility, Tom. So I'd go and watch Albion. I'd go and watch that lot down the road. I'd go and watch Birmingham. And he sent me to a League Cup type, Bristol Rovers, early in the 99-2000 season, I would guess. Gary Rowett scored a free kick winner. But Tom had tipped me the wink that um, I could go and interview Trevor before the game, get a pre-match interview with him cleared it with the club and everything. I could speak to him on the pitch, you know, before, way before kickoff. And so I went to the Memorial Stadium in Bristol, parked up, set up my equipment, came down to pitch side, went to the tunnel, asked to speak to oh, uh, uh, Capital Gold. Um, Trevor Francis has agreed to an interview. And he came out, got his goal 30 seconds later, and I was totally starstruck. So what would I, I'd have been about 30... 31 years of age and the fanboy in me could barely be contained and I've got to try and keep my composure because I've got to ask him questions yeah. about the time coming up and about what team he's picking yeah uh, and and what his feelings are about the league cup this season and I did the interview and shut the tape player down that we used and Trevor just said eight out of ten very good and turned around and walked back down the tunnel he was marking me out of ten for my interviewing technique and I <laughs> I must have stood there for about 30 seconds. God, did he just say that to me? And I'm walking back. First person I ring is my dear old dad. I said, Dad, I've just interviewed Trevor Bloody Francis. <laughs> and my dad couldn't get a handle on it because, you know, that was the guy that he first took me to see back in 1974. Yeah. So moments like that, you, you just cradle them as close to your heart as you possibly can. Yeah, yeah. understandably so. Um uh, I suppose moving on, I, obviously I know that you're a keen musician and you have been for a number of years. And obviously despite all the great theatres, auditoriums and whatnot that you've played at, I suppose the career-defining moment must obviously be the Blue Nose Brothers with Tom Ross, <laughs> as you touched upon earlier on. I suppose what was the creation process of that like? Like, well, just the whole uh, All I can rem remember was... The Birmingham fans had started singing the da 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 thing. Yeah. And the singing the blues. They started this singing the Guy Mitchell song as well. And it set off an idea in my head that I wanted to record it. Spoke to Tom about it. Tom was well into the idea. And at the time, um, I'd been recording um a a guy's house. Ron Rogers was his name. He was the guitar player and songwriter into power. You know, the massive hit with China in your hand and heart and soul in the late eighties. He lived near Monmouth in South Wales. And I got to know him through a band that I was in. Um, and he just set up a recording studio, at his new house. And I was his guinea pig. Um, and so I went there and recorded the, the drums, the guitar, the bass, the keyboards, whatever. Tom came in and, and, and helped out on the vocals. And um, that was the Blue Nose Brothers. And I'm trying to think what year that was. 2000, was it? Or 2001? Um, it's all a blur. But as I said, because that sold so well, that first singing the blues, which incorporated that and yeah. 
there was a verse of Keep Right On in there, and they still play it at the ground, of course. As, yeah, post-match yeah. tune. Yeah, still, um, yeah, it's kind of a tradition. I, I love that. God, how does that make me feel? You know, it's... Yeah. It's, yeah. Hits you right in the feels, that. Yeah. Um, and so because of the success of that, we Tom and I just kept on occasionally getting together and recording uh, new songs. Tom came up with the idea of Ole Ola, which was based on the Scottish World Cup 1978 anthem that Rod Stewart had done. That didn't yeah. sell as well. Um, <laughs> we did, when Steve Bruce was manager, we did Can't Keep Us Down instead of Don't Bring Me Down by ELO when we got promotion under Brucey again, you know, after we'd been down and came straight back up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was just it, it, just an excuse to, A, get my rocks off in a recording studio and B, create something for the club I love. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, that's brilliant because you get to combine the two things that I suppose you love most, really. Yeah. Um, so no, that's brilliant. And uh, I mean, Tom's defo somebody we want to get on the pod one day. So uh, I'm sure he'll agree. Yeah, hopefully uh, we can pull that off at some point. But um, I suppose just coming on to present time at Blues, uh, what do you think of the current state of play really at Blues? And what are your thoughts on our season so far? It's horrific. <laughs> Best Absolutely way horrific. Um, I watched... I saw Karanka's post-match interview with Dale on Saturday and the amount of times he's shrugging his shoulders. Yeah. His body language yeah. is horrible. Even it, what he said on WM. Yeah, well. it's 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 like he doesn't really know how to solve it. Mm. We've yeah. had a free week with the players, so we can't look at the defeat to Luton and say, oh, we had a game in midweek, players might be a little leggy. We had no midweek game. Uh, he's able to, you know, bring some of the players in. That He's like Valerie got a, a debut and whatnot. And it still didn't work. And there's yet more lamentable defending for the only goal of the game, just as there was horrible defending at Bournemouth the week before. That Wilshire header, all the Birmingham oh. defenders around him in a circle like it's ring a ring a road. It's horrible. Mm. Um, and you can't see it changing. No. You want to see it changing, and you see players arrive like Cosgrove, um, who, you know, my Scottish commentator friends tell me is a good acquisition and, you know, should be perfectly attuned at championship level. But you just worry that. Well, you've got to get the chuffing ball up to players like Cosgrove for him to be effective. And Hogan, as I understand it, I wasn't, I didn't see the game on Saturday. I was commentating on a game at Watford. But everything I read saw on the pitch for 70 minutes, Scott Hogan, no service. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a pattern that has been in place throughout, I guess. You know, yeah. and we've had the, the slew of Spanish talent that, Pep Clotet brought in that did nothing. Vialba, Jimenez, others. The Dan Crowley thing didn't work out. That's as we all hoped it would. And he's gone. Um, I don't know. It's just, it, it, Where do you turn? Where, where do you look within the squad and find some vestige of hope that somebody is going to grab a game by the scruff of the neck and and help us over the line. And look, yeah. I'll, I'll witness this at first hand on Saturday when I go up to Hillsborough for the yeah. um, for the commentary game because I can only tell so much from what I watch on iFollow and what I see on the the highlights programs and what I read. You have to see it with your own eyes. You have to see the team shape with your own eyes and 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 the the body language that the cameras don't show. So yeah, um, I, I, I think we we. We've been really lucky. Like last sort of week or two, we've had sort of um, Martin O'Connor, Paul Tate, um, on a different sort of tack, um, Lee Clark. But the <clears throat> the consistent across all of that, the teams that Martin O'Connor played in, the teams that Paul Tate played in, there were probably four, five, six, seven leaders on that pitch mm -hmm. where you knew that if you had to get in the trenches, it might not be pretty. But you could maybe see us 
grinding adults out, getting on the front foot, doing the dirt, you know, doing the dirty work. I think, my, my, and we, we mentioned this on a pod a couple of days ago. At the moment, I've got George Friend mm-hmm. and may, <clears throat> maybe, maybe Djokovic. But other than that, we haven't got a central midfielder in the in the team that can do it. Yeah, uh, you, you would hope that Sunjic would have been that that player to, yeah. to, 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 to assume that role through the spine of the team. Yeah. Yes, I agree. You look beyond Friend and Jukovic and there's not a great... that You would expect Harley Dean to have that ability to, to, to lead the team through, but he's having a, a really torrid time at the minute, as most Birmingham players are. Of course, Jukovic isn't really getting a look in. Mm. And there were all those stories that they were prepared to let him go on loan. I, I think Huddersfield were very close yeah. to getting him on loan before the window shut. Um, <clears throat> the keepers, Etheridge, he's an upgrade on Lee Camp. But even he's had his moments and I saw he was... I'm not sure whether the criticism levelled at him for the Luton goal on Saturday is particularly fair because it, no. it's just an instinct, you know, oh, put your hands up. It just hit him in, you know. For me, he it, does his job. Yeah, it's an instinctive reflex. Get something of your body in the way of it. Yeah. But, of course, he's had a couple of moments this season as well, hasn't he, which which haven't been which haven't yeah. been great. Um, it, and just, just any just, player that's sorry, shown... Just, never, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, because you're, you're probably, well, not necessarily closer to it, but you, you probably know more than a lot of, I, I would class, you know, just normal Blues fans, mm. just around the ownership of the club. I mean, <laughs> is, is there, a, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's it's like... I was going to come know, on to that next. Wheels in wheels, isn't it? It, it, so I, I just don't know how it's run. And, and I think it's a really good snapshot of, it's it seems to be a bit of a circus at the top. And it's just all cascaded down to what's on the pitch. I mean, yeah. what any insights into the ownership? None whatsoever. I, and you have to credit Daniel Ivory for the um, the work that he's done with the previous regime and with the current regime in terms of lifting the lid on how the Hong Kong Stock Exchange works yeah. and, and 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 trying to pick apart the all the strands of ownership and share issues and and goodness knows what. And, you know, you saw that sort of handwritten uh, graph that he made. Yeah. Of the, the, the strands of ownership and the connections. And it's, well, it's, it's just a big bowl of spaghetti bolognese, that, isn't it? It's just... It's here, there and everywhere. And it, it, you can't make head or tail of it. Um, the issue I have... And um, I'm going to speak for a few people who aren't here to defend themselves at this point, is that journalists are being made the scapegoats for the silence of the ownership. Now, Richard Wilford at WM managed to get that exclusive interview with Dong last Friday. Uh, And of course, that interview has come from, in large part, the fact that Dong trusts Richard. Yeah. Uh, and no doubt information has passed between, uh, you know, those two on transfer dealings and, and Richard's had some, you know, the Wilf bombs and everything. Yeah. But there is no way that Richard was going to be able to ask the sort of questions that fans think should be asked because the lines of communication would be cut dead immediately by Dong and Trillion Trophy Asia and anybody else who's got their fingers in the pie. Yeah. So I credit Richard with asking the questions that he felt able to ask last week, but I will not have it that he's, you know, we had this thing, this garbage years ago with Panu's pets. The yeah. of us, you know, who had a, in the media who had an interest in Birmingham City was somehow on Peter Panu's side and, you know, brushing everything under the carpet because we wanted to protect him. Never heard such baloney in my entire life. Uh, it was because they didn't want to talk. Well, I mean, Panu did want to talk, but it was normally aggressive, you know, 
you say anything like that, I'll sue you or whatnot, you know. Yeah. You don't really take on a triad busting cop from Hong Kong unless you've got something concrete. And to be fair to Daniel Ivory, that's what he had. And, you know, he started to unravel the puzzle. Yeah. yeah. Whether somebody can unravel this puzzle, whether it's Daniel or whether it's somebody else, I don't know. But it's amazing to think that this ownership strand that we have now is even more secretive, even more mysterious, even one, more cloak and dagger than what we have with Birmingham International Holdings. And yeah. I will not have it that journalists like, I mean, you know, Brian Dick at the Mail, say or, Brian Dick. Jeff, or Tom, or Neil Moxley, or, you know, whether it's myself or Chris Scudder, kind of guys who are on the fringes, don't go to the games, but of course still love the club. Uh, we're not we're not to be made scapegoats for the, the lack of communication because I can tell you that everybody tries to get answers out of Wren. Yeah. Everybody tries to get a, a, a quote. Richard's been able to get that hour long interview and, and huge credit to him for that. But he's a lone voice that's been able to earn that trust. And it's because people want to ask the questions that they don't want to answer. Yeah. And they exactly. will not answer those questions. So don't come to me and say, why aren't you asking the right questions? A, they're going to want to talk to me or whoever in the first place. And B, they won't answer those questions. Hmm. They won't. And, and I think credit to, there was a lot, you'd have seen it. There was a lot on Twitter pre, when, they, when the show went out. He was getting a lot of clog early doors for, you know, without actually people listening to what, what, how the interview me. went. Yeah. yeah and, and I have to say, I listened to the phone in after, which was a joy. I mean, <laughs> it, it really was in, in a funny way, not in a, because every single blues fan that came on with Richard, they said, thank you. You know, and they weren't cherry picked, you know, they said, thank you for asking the questions, probably got more out of it than, than a lot of people thought that, that he would. The best we've had in three years. Yeah. And, and, and there was, there was things in there that, he, he probably didn't need to ask the really direct, aggressive questions because the way that he did it, we got the answers we wanted anyway, which was, you can't necessarily trust a word that's coming out of the club at the moment, in my personal view. I think there's a lot of... Um, a very much Dong and, and Karanka are one in the same person, this completely blind faith of we're going to get out of it, and I think that they're probably the only two people that think that. But just around who owns the ground, he said it will be okay or something like that. Um, yeah, not not great as far as I was concerned, but, but I think he did a good job. You're not going to get those answers. You're not going to get that clarity on on the issues that worry us all about the state of the Tilton Road end and and, and the and the state of the you know cop yeah. uh, the cop stand and whatnot and. You know, how on earth that's going to get fixed? You can't, well, you know, they claim it's just a few nuts and bolts and whatnot. We don't know that. We haven't seen the, the you know, the, the, the safety briefings, have we, that health and safety have done. Um, when you look at the, the, the last, you know, what, six managers in four years or whatever, isn't it? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, if it was more. Joan Don Ren is the, he's the common thread that runs through that extraordinary turnover in personnel and some of the managers shouldn't have been employed in the first place some of them definitely shouldn't have been dismissed yeah um but the 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 decision making has been really odd i think i think that's a, a really a, a quite a good segue to um do you think Rowett's going to be quite motivated this coming Wednesday? Yeah. What's your prediction for that Millwall game? Gary doesn't... He doesn't need the motivation to beat us because of what happened when he was dismissed. He's Millwall manager. Yeah. And he's got other fish to fry because Millwall fans are just as demanding as we are. And they've, you know, not been in brilliant form of late they're not in the trouble that we are but um you know he, he wants to get some consistency back in their results but 
it's that's not a great game for us to have. Yeah. Um, no, I think um, the aggressive way that Gary sets his teams up, and we've seen it, and we've seen it. It may not be pretty, but it's pretty effective. Yeah. yeah. Um. So that's not an ideal. Well, what is an ideal fixture for us at the minute? There isn't one. We no. played Wickham twice. And they've taken four points off us. You'd yeah. think that was ideal, but it's not. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're being seen as the whipping boys of the championship. I'd say we were. Well, we, we've certainly become that. If you look at the yeah. calendar year of 2020 and the form that all 92 teams were in, somebody posted it up online about two or three weeks ago. And of the 92 clubs in English football... In terms of results in the year 2020, we were something like 89th. There was like Stevenage and a couple of others. Forgive me, I can't remember who beneath us. But we were like fourth or fifth from bottom of that chart of 92. Yeah. So no, there is no, there is no game that suits us at the moment. There is no opposition that plays into our hands. It's quite the opposite. Um, Play into theirs. I, I, I just think that run of. Um, yeah, Wick Cov. I mean, Cov. I mean, no, but no, but Mark Robbins is he working on shirt buttons, but he's made some canny acquisitions. You know, he's he's trusted in some of those players that got them up from from League One. Um, they're used to playing at St Andrews now. Yeah, they've got a better record at St Andrews than we have, which isn't hard, but they've got it. Um, we should honestly, we are where we are for a reason. We shouldn't look at Coventry and be going, Why the hell are Coventry do? They just are, yeah. they are doing better than us. We've got to deal with that. We've got to deal with that reality that Coventry, who let's not forget, in the not too dim and distant past, we're in the Premier League for year after year when we were nowhere near it. Yeah, you are where you are. Let's get out of this entitlement sort of thing we have in our heads that. We should be doing better than Coventry. Nope, they're doing better than us. We've got to suck it up and get well, on. It is. Yeah, definitely. Um, I suppose just kind of bringing things to a close, just a couple more things really would be, if things do turn sour for Itor and he gets axed, who would you personally want to see brought in? If we go down to League One, which seems increasingly like it's going to happen, and Karanka stays till the you know until relegation happens or wh however it plays out um paul cook yeah same for me um given what he did first at portsmouth then at wigan um i think he's a smart smart operator at lower league level um i would look at him straight away uh, as an option but that's all semantics, really. Um, but that's one name that immediately springs to mind since you come to mention it. Definitely. And I think, um, obviously, you look at what he did back end of last season. He was unlucky not to keep Wigan up in the end. I thought they were going to stay up. I actually think they went on that run and I, I said on air, they're going to do it. And, of course, they, they missed out by, well, was it goal difference even that sent them down? I can't remember. But, you know, yeah. definitely unlucky with the run they went on. Towards the end of last play season, play like that unpaid as well. It's yeah, yeah. No, no, look, he's he's um, you know, he's a very straightforward character, Paul Cook. Um, I like that about him, and he does understand the EFL and the machinations of it, you know, and uh, uh and whatnot. Um, so I, I'd be looking at somebody like him that that understands the understands the league, <laughs> you know. In the same way Barry did, although Barry had way more experience back in the nineties, all the years he'd spent at Barnet and South End before he came to us. Yeah. So, do you think that um again, which came out the interview on Friday, it seemed to be that if we did get relegated, how, how's the club as in financially, what what's the impact? Do we go out, do we go under? I mean, I I I'm just I mean the the the, the Bellingham money obviously saved us yeah um paid off a certain amount of debt although the debt's still loaded onto the club there's still you know i don't know what our 
operating loss would be for this financial year compared to others it would probably be fairly similar i don't think i think we you know a lot of the ridiculous wages that we had when Redknapp, Darren Dean and Jeff Atiri presided over that impossibly bad transfer window three or four years ago. Yeah, I think we're through the worst of that now. Uh, no thanks to those three gentlemen. Um, but it's still a perilous financial situation. I don't believe that it's as cut and dried as we get relegated, we'll be all right. I don't think any club that gets relegated from the championship to League One. Sunderland. Unless they've been working on shirt buttons as a budget, like Barnsley, who don't, they don't overspend on players. They've been able, and Charlton, they've been able to kind of yo-yo oh, between Championship and League One in, in, in recent seasons because they're, they're kind of on that cusp. Yeah. For us, with the budgets we've been working on and the wages we've been paying in the past three or four years, that's dangerous. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, I suppose a bit of a comedy one, touching on your impressions earlier. Um, if Trevor Francis was in charge of the game against Millwall, what do you think he'd be saying to the team on Wednesday night? Uh, I'd probably be saying, uh, watch about an hour and a half of my goals on uh, YouTube. And, uh, <laughs> basically, copy them. Uh, <laughs> I know you can do it. Uh, because I did it, and if I did it, you can. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Love that. Um, I suppose I was going to ask you quickly, if there was one player you could bring back to help this squad, who would it be? Well, Trevor's an obvious one. Because, yeah. because, but looking defensively, you'd want a leader back there, because what we were talking about earlier with the, the, the lack of leadership, I don't know. Uh, God, there's dozens. I mean, all those players you mentioned earlier, Martin O'Connor, um, Paul Devlin, Paul Tate, Liam Daish. Yeah, he, he had he had a shout. He had a shout from somebody else. Liam Daish, somebody like that, just to just to knock some sense, knock some heads together, and yeah. and you know concentrate minds. I, somebody I think, like Daish would be yeah. would be up there for me. I think. I, th I think we've got a centre half partnership of Bruce and Daish now, which is because uh, we were actually going to build yeah. the team that. Uh, from from our guests that come on, and um, yeah, it's, it's looking well. Yeah, I, th I think they'd actually do better now, <laughs> like for like at the age they're at. Well, I've seen some great centre halves at Blues down the years. You think from you know Joe Gallagher, Colin Todd, people like that. You, you know, um, but Daish embodied the the captaincy as much as anybody I can think of in the time that he was with us. Yeah, um, and really did lead by example. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, Daishi, please. Fair enough. Well, uh, that brings things to a close then. Thank you, everyone who's tuned in to watch this podcast. And a big thank you to Ian for coming on the podcast. It's been great having you on, mate. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank no you. Worries. Um, obviously, keep an eye out for our future pods. We've definitely got some big ones coming up at the moment. And don't forget to look at our Patreon page if you've got a spare minute of time and just drop a like or a comment. Just let us, let us know what you think. But uh, thanks for tuning in anyway. As always, guys, keep right on.